So, sure, to think that a family could do this is just, oh my goodness. Okay, so Chicago, Illinois, and it involves three people. So I just wanted to show you their faces so that you could see what we're dealing with. And the guy's name is Peter Bobak. And he was 40 years old at the time, from what I can gather, because, you know, there's so many reports and articles and there's uh, court cases and documents. And so you got to try and figure out what, how old were they at the time. Okay, <laughs> so I believe he was 40 years old at the time of the crime, which happened in April of 2019. So, of course, why is this case in the news now is because one out of these three people will be going to trial on January 26th of 2024. That's when it's scheduled for. So we've got Peter Bobak, 40. And then Desiree Figuera, 24. And then her mother, Clarissa Figuera, who was 46. Now, Peter, I see there's a lot of confusion in the articles. I'm not sure why. Okay, Peter was or is Clarissa's boyfriend. Desiree had a boyfriend too. And he's mentioned in the court document a little bit and mentioned in some of the articles, but it's not this guy. This guy is or was the boyfriend of Clarissa. Okay, Clarissa is the one that's going to be on trial January 26th of 2024. That's the date for now. Of course, we know things can get delayed, dates can change. So if you're watching this from the future, yeah, it won't help telling me <laughs> it's not happening now. You got it wrong because that's what it is right now. It might change, okay? So let's uh, let's get ready. Mods, um, buckle up. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you do. Welcome to all my patrons, members, and everybody here. Um, as I say, trigger warning. More than usual for this case. I'm going to walk through it gently. So Marlene Ochoa Lopez was only 19 years old. And she was born on November 16th of 1999 in San Luis de la Loma, Mexico. And she moved to the USA with her family when she was a toddler. She was the eldest child and had three siblings. She grew up and lived in Chicago, Illinois. She had a baby as a teen who was three years old in 2019, and she was still finishing a GED, going to school, uh, all of that, right? She was a very productive, successful, busy lady. Uh, let me quickly see. JB says pronunciation is likely Figueroa. <laughs> I've, I've heard a few pronunciations, and I do want to get it right, especially Marlene Ochoa Lopez is what I've heard her family say. Okay, so... She was nine months pregnant with her second child when she went missing on April 23rd of 2019. She was actually due to give birth um, in two weeks and had already named her son Giovanni Yadil Lopez. Her husband's name is Giovanni Lopez. In 2018, now we're going to look at, we're looking at the timeline, right? In 2018, Clarissa's 20-year-old son, so this is the person who's going to be on trial, okay? Her 20-year-old son, Xander uh, died of natural causes. I do not know. I've tried to dig exactly like what did he die of or how where he died of natural causes. In October of 2018, Clarissa told her family that she was pregnant. They were surprised and confused because she had previously told them that her fallopian tubes were tied. In December of 2018, Clarissa posted an ultrasound photo on Facebook to show the world the baby that she was carrying. Oh my goodness. So, what can we learn from this already? Uh, this is not the way to deal with grief. Wow. Like, like she lost her son. 20-year-old Xander died of natural causes. And then she's like, ta-da, I'm pregnant. Oh dear. And then things escalate from there. But if you really look at it from the start here, well, I don't know how her whole life was. She's got other kids. They say they were, they grew up in a, an abusive home and they were neglected. So I'm like, there's a lot of red flags, but still, if her son died and then she's suddenly like, okay, guys, I'm pregnant, you know, at, you can get pregnant at any age. I'm just saying at age 46, she's like, ta-da, guys. And the rest of the family's like, okay, but they, they believed her, you know? So, which also shows she's got a strong convincing manipulation abilities because they were like okay then so then she found a facebook group called help a mother out which was created to help offer baby items for families in need 
So you know how I say on social media, be very careful when you're looking for help. Because there's people out there that are fishing for targets, for people who are looking for help. Are they there to help you? You got to be careful sometimes of the help uh, that you receive, right? And this case is so sad. It's like, help a mother out. There's lots of mothers on there expecting babies and they want help to get baby clothes and strollers and, you know, supplies and things. If they can't afford to buy all of it or they think, okay, well, let's share. It's a community page. So on February 5th of 2019, she posted that she had decided to name her baby Xander. So remember her 20-year-old son that died? So now she's like, I'm pregnant and I'm naming the baby Xander. I'm saying Xander for you guys in America. <laughs> I'm South African, so I would say Xander. But Xander, okay. She even posted a photo of the baby room with a decorated crib. Oh yeah, she was going all out, okay? On March 5th of 2019, Clarissa posted, who is due in May? Where is the May mamas at? I mean, it seems like an innocent post. If you're in this group, help a mother out and someone says, hey, who's due in May? Where's the May mamas at? You wouldn't think that that's like, ooh, that's a red flag. Because it's part of the group. Everyone's connecting with each other and sharing supplies. So seven month pregnant 19 year old Marlon Ochoa Lopez responded that she was due in May. Clarissa then offered her free baby clothes and suggested that they start sending direct messages instead of communicating on like the Facebook wall, right? So Mama Goonster, <laughs> that's a cool name, said here from Chicago. To be honest, I don't think we live stream, but I hope. Welcome to all the locals in chat. If you are in uh, Chicago or from there, welcome to you. I know there's always locals in, in chat with whichever case I'm covering from wherever in the world. We've got a lovely international audience and it's always nice to see when you guys live around the area or you know about it or the case is local to you and to hear you know if you know more about the case if you know anything please send it to me um, if you want to share something that maybe i haven't covered here you can send it to me and i always keep my sources anonymous my email is grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com okay so back to the story uh, so clarissa then offered her free baby clothes and suggested that they send direct messages so I guess that's a small red flag because the group is, you know, for moms to help each other out with things. And she's just like, okay, I've got baby clothes. But she was first like, hey, 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 fishing for who's expecting. So here is a screenshot uh, from Clarissa's former page that said, uh, help a, well, this one says help a sister out. Who is doing May? Where's the May mama's at? And Bonnie, no client, said right here. And Clarissa said, I don't feel lonely anymore. Yay. Then she connected with Marlon, Marlon, and Marlon said, what's your location, hun? And Clarissa replied, I'm on the south side of Chicago by 79th and Pulaski. If you want to wait a week, my girl has all brand new boy clothes her son never wore. Marlon said, yes, girl, that's fine. Thank you so much. And then Clarissa said, no problem, girl. I know how it is. She was lucky to have two baby showers. So she just loves to spread the wealth. I'm fine with the help. Inbox me for more info, okay? Okay, deflection. So initially, she's trying to reach out. She's pretending, Clarissa now, that she's pregnant. Ultrasounds, pictures, like really, it's, it's kind of like sort of catfishing, right? It's just pre catfishing to be saying she's pregnant. And then saying, yeah, you know, that one of her daughters had two baby showers and they've got plenty of supplies. Wow. Um, Sharon says, I don't understand the natural cause in the death of a 20-year-old son. It could be a heart attack. It could be a stroke. It could be um, maybe an overdose of some sorts. I don't know. I don't know. There's many There's many things that could be natural causes. You know, you never know. Um, okay. So there's that ultrasound again. Now, on April 1st of 2019, Clarissa told her daughter, Desiree, that she needed some help. She wanted her help. She wanted her daughter Desiree's help to kill a pregnant woman so that they could have her baby. She had invited uh, Marlene over to come and look at some baby clothes. Clarissa 
her boyfriend, Peter, I think that's how you say that name, right? P-I-O-T-R. I mean, it's not Piotr. <laughs> I think it's Peter. Bobak and her daughter, Desiree, were there. Clarissa, okay, sorry. Yeah, they, oh yeah, Clarissa then told her daughter they needed, they needed to kill Marlene. Oh, man. Initially, Desiree said no. And then she told her own boyfriend about it. And her own boyfriend said he's going to call the police, if that's really the plan. On April 1st, 2019, Marlene went to their home. They were all in the basement of the home. And Peter said that Clarissa and Desiree had kept disappearing into another room together. And said that, and then her, Desiree's boyfriend said that she, he saw she was shaking. Um, this is not correct. I have to correct that. It's not Peter that told Desiree. It's actually Desiree's boyfriend that said he would call the police if they were actually going to kill Marlon. Marlon eventually left and Clarissa told uh, Peter that, don't worry, that was just an April Fool's joke. Not Peter, the boyfriend of Desiree. Sorry, this is confusing. The reports were so confusing. I figured it out. I clearly didn't update this slide. One more time. So there's Clarissa, Peter. Then there's uh, Desiree, Clarissa's daughter, and her boyfriend. It's Desiree's boyfriend that was, the red flags were going off. He was like, what are you all doing? Why are you going into the kitchen the whole time? What are you guys talking about? Is this for real? Like, do you really want to kill a pregnant lady? What are you doing? I'm going to call the police. And so Clarissa told that boyfriend, don't worry, this is just an April Fool's joke. So Marlene had actually been there once before. One, that one time, okay, on April 1st. She was lured back there a second time, right? So Marlene Lopez posted on April 22nd, it shows, Mommy's in here, by any chance, is anyone selling, trading, or just simply donating a double stroller your babies don't use anymore? I just really need one for my baby soon to be born and my two-year-old, preferably neutral color. I'd really appreciate it. It'll be such a great help. I'm also selling a single stroller neutral. For $50, brand new in the box, willing to trade for a double stroller. New Southside and Gage Park, I can pick up. All right. So, I see <laughs> there's lots of people in the chat saying that you remember this case. There's actually quite a few that, that are similar, which is even more scary. You know, in some of my research, then they start referencing other cases because it's so similar. But if you do know the case... Um, yeah, let me know if I'm leaving anything out or because I, the more I look at this case, the more you find and what a rabbit hole it is. Oh my word. So, of course, Marlena was looking for help and Clarissa was there to help. You just, wow, you just, you can't believe, I can't believe this would happen from a Facebook post where mothers are trying to help each other, right? All right, so... April 23rd of 2019. Marlene was invited back to their home and drove her black Honda Civic there, which I assume would be for the stroller then. I think the first time she was there was for baby clothes and then she posted, does anyone have a double stroller and she can pick up and all of that? And so I think that's how Clarissa would have lured her back there saying, yeah, we, we've got that for you. You can come on over. So when she got there, she made herself comfortable on the couch in the living room. By the way, the first time she was there and they said they're in the basement, police later said it was like a secret basement, which I don't even know what that means. But remember when they talked about Rex Hureman in the Long Island serial killer case and people said secret <laughs> basement and then they had to clarify it's not a secret basement. Well, this sounds like it could have been a secret basement. It's sus. Okay, it's like a red flag basement. Don't know what all goes on in there, but okay. So... The second time, April 23rd, 2019, when she got there, she made herself comfortable on the couch in the living room. Now you could see all those caution, trigger warning symbols I've got up there because really trigger warning. If you're only joining the stream now, this case is very scary, very sad and very graphic. And I'm going to try my best to cover it as sensitively as I can. Okay. So when... Marlene got to the house. She sat on the couch and made herself comfortable. Clarissa and Desiree then played some music. So that's Clarissa and her daughter played some music and they turned up the volume. Then they went to the kitchen together to discuss their plan. They agreed on strangling Marlene and then taking her baby. Desiree 
distracted. So Clarissa's daughter distracted Marlene with a photo album of her late brother Xander. So Desiree literally walks over to this 19-year-old pregnant lady who thinks she's there to pick up a stroller and says, you see this? Look at this photo album. My brother passed away. Yes, he passed away in 2018. The natural causes, yeah, flipping through a photo album. While being distracted with that photo album. Okay. Uh, And she was sympathizing with them for their loss. I mean, it must have been kind of confusing. Like now we're going down memory lane with a tragedy in this family that she doesn't even really quite know. Clarissa suddenly wrapped a, they said it's a coaxial cable, a cable around her neck from behind. Now, Marlene reacted quickly and placed her fingers between the cable and her neck. I don't know if you guys have seen those YouTube shorts or TikToks where they're actually like police officers or self-defense instructors will teach you that if someone is hiding out in the back of your car or something and they suddenly you know, put something around your neck, then they show that you need to like immediately grab like that and put your fingers between it. I think Marlene obviously knew that and she did that, right? So she kept some pressure on the cable, which uh, helped for a little bit. But then Clarissa shouted at her daughter Desiree and said, you're not doing your effing job. And so Desiree sprung into action and began to pull Marlon's fingers away from her neck one by one. So one by one, she pulled them away, which then, of course, allowed Clarissa to tighten that cable. She strangled her for four to five minutes. This case is not easy, oh my goodness. No cases are, but some are just like (laughs) the horror. It's just incredibly scary. So I hope you won't have nightmares tonight. Court documents state that Marlene had reached out and touched their dog's nose. So their dog is there too. You know what I mean? It's just like, what a scene. It's Clarissa and her daughter. Where the freak is Peter in this situation? Where's where's Clarissa's boyfriend right now in this situation? So court documents state that Marlene had actually reached out while she was being strangled and touched their dog's nose. And then she had relieved herself and then had died. Clarissa and Desiree, and remember she was two weeks away from giving birth to her second child, a son that she was expecting. Clarissa, and the story gets worse, so trigger warning, all the way through. Okay, Clarissa and Desiree then researched, is what the court documents say, aka Googled. Mm, Yeah, they went to Google. I mean, after that, after all that, then they go to Google to check, you know, if they did things right. And after learning that, yes, okay, yeah, it does. They checked with each other. Does it really take four to five minutes to strangle someone? Does it mean that now she's dead? That's what they were researching. So they they learned that, okay, yes, it does take four to five minutes to strangle someone with a rope or a cord. And they said that, yeah, okay, when, when the victim relieves himself, then they know they've died. Like, can you imagine what's going to come out of this trial? So then, after that, they were ready to proceed to the next step. Because remember, that wasn't their primary intention. They wanted something. How scary. These cases kind of freak me out. You know, these, uh, I can't really say the words that it's termed under. Abduction is one word. The word before that, I can't really say. I can't put the combination there together, but you know what it is. Man. Okay, so... Shame. Uh, Myri or Miri said Marlene's husband and family have been waiting so long for this trial. They really have. I mean, there's so many clips of uh, Marlene's family out there. You know, they had uh, having vigils on the year, like anniversary, if you can call it that, the year mark, right? Every year, and they've just there's a there's tributes to them, and oh, man, it's just so sad. It's so sad to see yeah, how long the family's been waiting for justice in this case. I mean, this is absolutely horrendous. Jeannie says the barbarity of it all is unbelievable. I mean, it's so shocking. And this is what I'm saying. If you're now going, if you've never heard of this case and you're kind of learning about this for the first time, yeah, you're going to experience what I experienced because I'm like, 
the more I went, I'm like, and then it gets worse and even worse. And then what? It's just like every twist and turn. It's just like, wait, what? So they researched on Google, right? They were like, okay, I think we've done it. I mean, okay. Clarissa then instructed her daughter to get a blanket, a large plastic bag, and a knife. She scurried off to get the items, brought them to her mom, and then she left the room. All right. Uh, Clarissa got to work. See, I'm trying to say it very sensitively. The court documents say it in a way that we will never unsee it because I think lots of us are visual learners and we visualize things in general, right? Anyway, so she got to work and uh, extracted the baby and then placed the baby inside a bucket. Okay. She then called Desiree, her daughter, to help her to put Marlene's body in a plastic bag after she'd wrapped her in a blanket and she tied it tight, apparently. It's just, can you believe that a Facebook connection looking to trade items or pick up items at a discount or whatever it is turns into this? It's unbelievable. It's shocking to think that this even happened in our world, but unfortunately it's happened a lot. There's a, there's a lot of these types of cases. Sure, it's scary. So. Clarissa then took the plastic bag out herself and put it in a garbage can that was hidden on the side of their garage. She went back inside and noticed that the baby wasn't breathing. So after all that, which is horrific, now the baby's not breathing. So she called 911. Oh my word, we're going to hear that 911 call. What the heck? She called 911 and she told the operator that she had delivered her baby on her own and the baby wasn't breathing. The CFD, Chicago Fire Department, I believe that's what that is. They say they also provide emergency assistance, right? It's not just firefighters, it's emergency assistance too. They came out there, they responded to help her. When they got there, she was holding the baby. Now, this detail I just put in there, it's in the court documents, just so you understand the situation. She's holding the baby. Apparently, a neighbor also saw this. Still with the placenta and umbilical cord attached. And Clarissa and her baby were then rushed to the Advocate Christ Medical Center in Oak Lawn, Illinois. That neighbor apparently said, based on reports and documents that... Uh, when they saw Clarissa saying that she just delivered, she just had a baby, and the baby's not breathing, they noticed that she had like blood on her face and on her arms, but not anywhere on her lower half. Okay. So Clarissa and her baby were then rushed uh, to the Advocate Christ Medical Center in Oaklawn, Illinois. Doctors then placed baby. Uh, it took a while to identify him, but we know now, of course, in hindsight, baby Yavoni Lopez in ICU on life support for 52 days and sadly he passed away. Marlene's family was, they were really hoping that he would survive. It took some time for investigators to figure out what the heck was going on here because it was first a missing persons case, a missing pregnant teen. And they had no clues as to where she was until they looked into her social media and found her car. We're going to watch the press conference because they explain the timeline of their investigation very well. So I just saw earlier, um, you know, some people may have confused the case with others because in some cases the baby survived. In this case, sadly not. Okay, now brace yourself. Brace yourself. That means, okay, already. Here we go. Prepare to be sickened. This is Clarissa. And that's her at the hospital, pretending that the baby's hers. And for, didn't calculate exactly how many days, for like about three weeks, her and her boyfriend were there, pretending the baby was theirs. While, I want to say her name right, is it Marlene or Marlene? I've heard it different ways now. Marlene's family is how it's spelled, right? They didn't know where she was. 
they don't know if she like did someone abduct her did did she give birth somewhere did she run away where is she right now while there's a little um screenshot i've got there while they say this from the court document while at the labor and delivery section at christ hospital defendant clarissa was examined but showed no signs consistent with the woman who had just delivered a baby uh, defendant clarissa did have blood on her arms hands and across her face which was from the murder of v which is victim and the removal of her baby the blood was cleaned off by an ob technician who treated defendant clarissa at the hospital Ooh, the family is outraged that the hospital has not been held accountable because they can see this doesn't make sense like <laughs> Should we maybe do a DNA test? I don't know if they ever do that at hospitals, do they? But they should to do things like that or just be like, this doesn't make sense. She said she's given birth, but there's no signs that this woman has given birth. Okay, so as I say, there, there were no signs consistent with a woman who had just delivered a baby. She had the victim's blood on her upper half and the CFD doctors and hospital staff did not call the police. Okay, so if you work in the medical industry, I hope that that would be a lesson to, if you see something that really doesn't add up, yeah, yeah, maybe consider calling the police or speak to your manager or who, whatever you need to do. But if it doesn't add up, it doesn't add up. It could be really sinister. You just never know. All right, so, yeah, Janet says, even a blood test. I'm just watching you guys, your reactions. It's hectic, isn't it? Now, now, just when you think it can't get worse, it does. Clarissa and her boyfriend launch a GoFundMe. And they say, Pete Bobak said, My son is a fighter, made it this far, but not much time left. Life support, brain dead, very little function in the brain. Born 4 19 The audacity that Clarissa, I'm using the word extracted, of course, you know, what to be sensitive. Ex extracted this baby out of a pregnant teen's body that she had just strangled and her boyfriend saying he was born on that day that's the murder day anyway so my word don't get don't make me mad <laughs> so look he, he the family didn't know but these pictures in hindsight must be infuriating it was only th about three weeks later that they the police figured some stuff out okay but in that time these two are taking pictures with the baby and making a GoFundMe. And they say, I'm reaching out today on behalf of a precious little angel. This is now Clarissa writing this, apparently. Xander. Look what she called him. Xander. That's the name of her son who died of natural causes in 2018. She named this baby Xander. Xander Xavier Bobak. The neonatal intensive care unit, NICU, at Christ Hospital is a special place that I hope none of you ever need to be a part of. This part of the hospital is where they care for the sickest and tiniest babies who may live in the hospital for months at a time. Life in the NC NICU is a roller coaster ride for many families. Or for families, the ups and downs can be incredibly satisfying or equally heartbreaking. Watching a one-pound baby who quite literally fits in the palm of an adult hand grow up to laugh and play is nothing short of a miracle. But sadly, not every parent has that joy. Oh no, are you, are you shocked? I'm shocked, okay? I don't think I've ever been more shocked by a case. I'm just like, these people have just like, this is dark psychology. She said, but sadly, not every parent has that joy. On April 23rd, Clarissa... Figura, Figura, Fig let me just see there. <laughs> Someone said last name pronounced Figueroa, Figueroa. Okay. On April 23rd, Clarissa Figueroa, pregnant at 36 weeks, lies, okay, found herself terrified as she began to experience abnormal labor pains while alone in her house. Within moments, she gave birth to her son, Xander, at seven pounds as she called 911 and follow the instructions of the emergency dispatcher. Quickly, the ambulance came and rushed the baby and performed CPR as they found the baby had been struggling without oxygen. They were both admitted to the hospital to discover that Clarissa was suffering from pre-eclampsia, explaining the sudden birth. What a lie. What a lie. Oh my word. 
Xander, his mother Clarissa, and his father Peter Bobak have found themselves staying at Christ Hospital, desperately hoping Xander will pull through. In the NICU, some parents have to hold their infant as they take their last breath, and others get a call that their baby died suddenly in the middle of the night. This is what Clarissa and Peter are experiencing at this very moment. I know, <laughs> Joy is like, where? Wow, how long? I think they pulled it off for a few weeks. Oh, look at them, look at them. So let me just find my place there so quickly. The ambulance, yes, okay, last breath, wait. This is what Clarissa and Peter are experiencing at this very moment. They are preparing to say goodbye to their baby boy as they have to accept that Xander won't survive too much longer. Baby Xander, despite all he's going through, is a little fighter and has already captured the hearts of many family members. It is unimaginable loss that no person should ever have to endure. One you never get over. Honoring the short life that baby Xander had is a small way to help provide closure and start the mourning process for the family. Okay then, a funeral and burial are rituals that help people process this tragedy that they are trying to survive. A funeral is an outrageously expensive event, even for a baby, which many of our families can't afford. We set up this fund as a way to help Clarissa and Peter pay for a proper burial. This is the most difficult time in their life, already having suffered the loss of her son, Xavier, less, uh, less than two years ago. Clarissa is hoping that this is one small thing we can do to help them lay their baby to rest next to his brother. What? <laughs> this is all a lie. Please consider even a small donation. And thank you for taking the time to read and consider. God bless. Help spread the word. Man. Okay, if you're only joining the stream now, I hope that you've at some point, or I'm going to give one again. This case comes with a giant trigger warning. It is very scary, very upsetting, horrible. Horrendous. I've just, I, <laughs> yeah, pretty shocked. All right. So meanwhile, what were Desiree and Peter doing? Well, you know, initially, initially, when Clarissa had been rushed to the hospital. So we're going back to that moment there. What were they doing? Well, Desiree drove Marlene's Honda Civic to her sister's house and picked up two additional phones. She was captured on camera driving Marlene's car. She then got rid of Marlene's phone and parked her car a half a block away from their home. Smart. Smart criminals, huh? Uh, Peter helped to clean up the scene at the home and did not, in fact, call the police. Remember, it was actually Desiree's boyfriend who was clearly uninvited the second time that Marlene visited the home. Because I didn't hear from his, you know, I can't see that he was there that, at that time. It was, seems to be it was the three. As in Clarissa, Desiree, and Peter. Peter's helping clean up the scene. I also can't believe his charges were so minimal. You'll get, we'll get there. So he was eventually charged with the obstruction of justice and concealing a homicide. And he was sentenced to four whole years in prison. And they gave him credit for the time spent in jail, so he's already out. <laughs> hmm? Wow. Okay. So, on April 24th of 2019, that's the next day, right? The day after Marlene was last seen. Her husband reported her missing on April 24th of 2019. She was last seen leaving the Latino Youth High School. The police began the investigation and searched Marlene's Facebook account. They went then to Clarissa's house and were told that she was at the hospital because she had just given birth. That was still the story they're sticking to. Um, eventually, that's when the police eventually went there and they're like, what? Because, you know, um, Marlene's husband had said she's communicating with someone on Facebook. They located Marlene's car a half a block away. DNA samples were eventually obtained from Clarissa, Peter, and Marlene's husband. And they showed that that baby, shame, it wasn't Clarissa's or Peter's. But that took about three weeks, from the time that Marlene was uh, reported missing to the time when these DNA tests were done. Yeah, I mean, that was almost a month. It's pretty scary, right? Monarch says Illinois does not have the death penalty. Wow, okay. Yeah, you guys are like four years. And the screenshot I've got up there is just, uh, you know, 
when Marlene went missing? While Marlene's husband was initially the prime suspect in her disappearance and had to go through polygraph tests, and of course there were photographers that had captured him leaving, and they, everyone was reporting on this missing pregnant teen and just looking shame. I can't imagine social media back then because everyone was looking at him. He had to do um, polygraph tests, police interrogations, but he was eventually able to see and hold his son in the hospital after they identified him. That must have been very sad. And there are clips, um, you know, of him saying, there's many, just search for uh, Marlene's name in the YouTube search bar, for example, or on Facebook, and you'll find some clips as well. Okay, so the point is, he was eventually able to hold his son after learning that his wife was murdered and then his son died too. And thinking how sickening it is that for about three weeks, those two were pretending it was uh, their baby. Amethyst said, did these horrible people really think that they could get away with this? I don't know. They did say in the press conference they weren't smart. <laughs> so on May 14th of 2019, uh, police executed a search warrant at Clarissa's home because by then they had been investigating. They'd found Marlene's car. They checked out the Facebook messages. They'd done some DNA tests as well because they went to go and ask some questions there. They were piecing it all together. They did a really good job, right? And so they executed a search warrant. Clarissa, Peter, Desiree, and her boyfriend. So Clarissa and her boyfriend, Peter, Desiree and her boyfriend were at the home at the time. Peter was busy cleaning a rug outside with bleach and a hose. I mean, on May 14th, but yeah, he's outside cleaning a rug with bleach and a hose. And when he saw the officers, he dropped the bleach and the hose and walked away, you know, keeping it casual. Just like, oh dear, okay, just pretend I wasn't doing that. Right. Grumpy said, Illinois removed the ability to sentence offenders to life in prison last year. It's now a 30 year max. Oh no. <laughs> Grumpy, what? So, officers then located Marlene's remains hidden in the garbage can on the side of the house. Guys, they put Marlene's remains in that plastic bag in the garbage can on April 23rd of 2019 and just left it there. Whoa, that must have been a terrible discovery. Equinox says, I wouldn't watch this trial. It'd be graphic to me. I don't know. Yeah, same. I don't know if I'm going to cover it. I think it's going to be way too graphic. <laughs> it's really difficult. I mean, this it makes me feel, you know, that, that feeling when you just feel cold and numb because it's just so scary and shocking. It's just... So thank you for being here <laughs> and even hearing about this case. Of course, there must be Justin, uh, justice for Marlene and her baby. You know, I just wanted to to bring this case to you as well so that we can learn about it and also learn from it because it's just scary to think of what can go wrong in social media. Be very careful, right? So a CPD evidence technician found that blood was present in the living room area of the house. They did a luminal test, found it in multiple places, on door handles, on the floor, probably on that rug. The medical examiner ruled that Marlene had been strangled to death and her baby had been extracted from her abdomen. Desiree, who is Clarissa's daughter, immediately confessed to police. She confessed in a video recorded interview. Which is interesting, right? Very interesting dynamics. Right? It's, it's kind of like I worry about how abusive Clarissa and perhaps Peter may have been if her daughter was so compliant in this that she didn't want to do, and wait till you hear the next thing, you know, the, and yet as soon as the police question her, she just confesses everything. Okay. So there's just a picture, and I've got a bigger picture coming up um, just to show you the, the backyard where they, you know, thought they would just hide the victim's body. Yeah, and what was the plan? Like, for how long? What are they doing? Shame. You guys, this this picture, 
It really breaks my heart. That's uh, Marlene's family, her dad. Her dad was the one to help identify her body at the medical examiner's office. And he was, he was just about passing out when he walked out of there. I can't imagine. <laughs> so, Rose um, says, if you cover the case of, it <laughs> depends, you know, which types of cases might be too much for me mentally. It also depends on my whole audience. I mean, with William, we didn't, there weren't many details, like graphic details, right? This is going to be next level graphic because I can't even tell you the words that's in the court documents. They're going to just blast that out there on audio during the trial. We're going to hear terrible things. So I would rather keep an eye on it and then bring you summaries or presentation at the time. Obviously, here I'm very protective of victims and their families and also all the grizzlies, you know. There is a way to cover true crime in a sensitive way. And sometimes you're going to have to be very careful <laughs> because it might, it might get way too much, way too fast. And this case is a lot. And I'm bringing you a kind of censored version of this case right now based on everything I've read today because you won't unsee or unhear certain things, you know. I know we're all grown up, <laughs> but there's a lot of empaths here as well. A lot of um, people that have been through a lot as well. Helen, thank you so much. Oh, so Ma Marlene was laid to rest at the Mount Auburn Funeral Home in Stickney, Illinois on May 25th of 2019. And the press conference was held on May 16th that we're going to look at as well. I just really want to finish um, my presentation here. Okay, so here's another shocker. Desiree was pregnant at the time of the murder and gave birth in jail in November 2019? So Desiree, Clarissa's daughter, was able to assist in the murder of a 19-year-old pregnant lady. She assisted her mother, right? While she was pregnant? And that psychology, isn't that so crazy that Clarissa needed to find a stranger you know what i mean i don't mean pick on your own daughter i'm just like whoa that's some weird psychology unless her daughter was having a baby girl which that i'm not sure of and maybe clarissa really wanted to steal a baby boy uh, patricia says was there a funeral for baby i do believe so yes okay so desiree Wait, I've got to see that. Uh, Figi, Figar, Figaroa, Figaroa. Okay, so Desiree Figaroa, 29, she's 29 now, has just pleaded guilty to first degree murder. This was on January 8th of 2024. So she just decided, you know what? <laughs> I'm pleading guilty. She will spend 30 years in prison and sentencing for her will not happen until after her mother's trial, because part of her plea deal is that she will have to testify against her mother at the trial. That's said to take place January 26th of 2024, which is just around the corner, actually. In January of 2023, Peter was sentenced to four years in prison for obstructing justice. He received credit for time served and has already been released and is on six months probation. I don't know that his exact release date. I just read that he's already been released. He served his time. And that's that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Four years with credit. Sure. Okay. Um, so at his parole hearing, they said at his hearing, which I assume to be his parole hearing. So I might be wrong, but when they said at his hearing, I'm like, okay, and he's on parole. Okay. He said that he was misled by his then girlfriend as Clarissa and her daughter. He said that he had no prior knowledge of what the woman planned to do, but used poor judgment after the fact while cleaning up the crime scene. But he, he helped set up the GoFundMe, and he was posing with the baby. And he got four years? Uh, what? My goodness. Paul says, I don't even understand how these people could think they would gain anything by something so horrible. Crazy stupid. I know, right? Like, How do they really think they'd never get caught? It's just really not a smart crime at all. and it's brutal horrific now 
That's what he said at his parole hearing. He just, <laughs> his poor judgment when he helped to clean up the scene. He obviously had a good lawyer. So the Advocate Christ Medical Center, were they held accountable? No. The family was very upset by that. They said, this is a, I just took this screenshot from a news article from ABC7 so that I don't miss any of this, right? They said the state health department told ABC7 Eyewitness News there are no rules or regulations under the Illinois Hospital Licensing Act or under the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that require hospital emergency department employees to verify the identity of a baby or the person who brings a baby to the hospital. However, hospitals would be mandated to report to the Department of Children and Family Services, so DCF, right, under the Abused and Neglected Child Reporting Act if there was concern. This is an infant that was, you now see these types of words, it's horrible. I'm just going to read it. This is an infant that was ripped, born from violence, from criminals who sat around an incubator like he was in, like he was in and around several other children inside that facility. These monsters lurked, Contreras said. Someone must be held accountable. The hospital said it can't comment on the case. DCFS said that it was notified more than two weeks after the teenager was killed. So it took two weeks for someone at the hospital to notify them. And I wonder if it's someone at the hospital or the police because of the investigation, right? Yeah, Paula said, unfortunately, this has been done before and the baby lived. Yeah, that's what's so scary. There's there's actually quite a lot of cases like this. If you start looking at these, you know, and as I was reading on this, I saw this. Whew, it's, it's very scary. Okay, so they said the hospital can't comment on the case. They were, the DCFS was notified more than two weeks after the teenager was killed. Two days of visitation for Marlene are scheduled, and this was her funeral that happened on May 23rd and 24th. That may, The main funeral was held on May 25th of 2019. The three people charged in Marlene's murder are being held without bond. They're due back in court next month. So that's obviously already done. Um, so Desiree's pleaded guilty and she will face or spend, she will spend 30 years in prison, but she won't be sentenced until after her mother's trial. Peter got four years, he's released on parole, and then, allegedly, that's what they said, <laughs> and then he's, uh, and then Clarissa, oh, she's going to trial. She's going to go to trial on January 26th of 2024. What a shocking case. Um, a mural was made in Marlene's honor near 16th and Newbury. So if you're local, let me know if you've seen it by this artist called Milton Coronado. It's a beautiful mural that was made. So yes, yeah, so trial schedule start January 26th, 2024. Her charges include first degree murder and aggravated battery against a child. And she's, of course, pleading not guilty. So, you know, which is the standard. Okay, so that's what I've uh, managed to pull together for you in this presentation. Because, wow, not only is there a lot to present <laughs> and to talk about, there could be another, lots of details, lots of clips, lots of things. But I'm going to stick to um, that presentation, the timeline overview, what happened and covering it as sensitively as I can. And now we're going to look at the press conference, which took place on May 16th of 2019. Okay, I've boosted the sound for us, so it should be good. I did hear that at some point during this press conference, they sound only in one ear. So if you're experiencing that or you can't hear, just try to put your, your earphones or your AirPods or whatever in the other ear. <laughs> okay, so this, this case happened in Chicago, Illinois. It happened April 23rd of 2019, where a pregnant 19 year old was murdered and she was nine months pregnant due in two weeks sure what okay so let's let's have a listen because here they give a good timeline at this press conference i might play it at 1.25 speed i'll just have a look Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> We're here to announce that three individuals have been charged with the brutal murder of missing 19-year-old Marlon Ochoa, a wonderful young woman and expected mother who was nine months pregnant at the time of her disappearance in late April. For the past three weeks, 
Area South detectives have worked tirelessly following up on leads, interviewing witnesses, and gathering evidence in an attempt to locate Marlon. On the 7th of May, CPD received a break in the missing person investigation and learned that Ms. Ochoa was in communication with one of the offenders, which brought us to the area of 77th and Pulaski. So I'm just going to pause for a second. If you think about it, it's from April 23rd, when Marlene was last seen, all the way to May 7th, that Clarissa and Peter were able to pose and pretend as if they were the parents of the baby that they stole. That is so scary. Ultimately, DNA evidence and interviews led us to the three offenders that are now charged. I'm sad to report that on the 14th of May, detectives executed a search warrant and our investigation took a terrible turn while at the residence on the 4100 block of West 77th Place. It was there that detectives finally located the remains of a female in a trash can that were later verified to be 19-year-old mother to be Marlon Ochoa. During the investigation, detectives discovered that a 46-year-old female from an address on West 77th Place claimed to have given birth to a child that was not breathing. Through DNA testing, we are now certain that the child was Miss Ochoa's and two of those responsible have been charged with murder and one has been charged with concealment of a crime. Words really cannot express how disgusting and thoroughly disturbing these allegations are. And I'd like to offer, offer my sincere condolences and prayers to Marlon's family who instead of celebrating the arrival of a new life into their family, are now mourning Marlon's loss, while at the same time caring for a new little baby who remains in grave condition. So now I'd like to introduce Deputy Chief of Detectives Brendan Dinahan, who will provide you all with a timeline and further details of the investigation. Okay, so now we're gonna get a, a good timeline of how they conducted the investigation. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, this, uh, as the superintendent mentioned, this is a pretty uh, terrible and horrific case and our hearts go out to the family and friends of Marlon. Uh, I wanna thank all the officers and uh, the detectives uh, behind me here, including our partners at the Illinois State Police Crime Lab and all of our members of our uh, Chicago Police Department Crime Lab personnel who help process all the evidence, uh, the evidence of this scene. It's a pretty terrible uh, crime scene. I'm going to give you guys kind of a, a basic timeline. I think uh, almost everybody kind of already knows, uh, you know, what occurred. But I just want to explain what these uh, detectives did for the last uh, several weeks, and then we'll take some uh, questions that, that you may have. So on the 23rd of April, Marlon was last seen, and on the 24th of April, Marlon's husband reported her uh, missing. On the 25th of April... Of course, this press conference took place on May 16th of 2019, so when they're saying dates, it's all 2019. Okay, just in case anyone's confused, I put a little banner up there as well so that you can see that. Um, also, for those asking, why did it take so long to get to trial? Um, it, sometimes it takes long, but also I think in this case, the, the pandemic may have been a factor, right? Okay. April, the husband came into Area South the Detective Vision to start helping the detectives uh, with this case. So from the 25th of April through the 7th of May, detectives are basically working with the family and friends trying to locate Marlon and her car. It's during this time frame we don't have any reason to believe that she's in the area of 77th and Pulaski. This is not where uh, she doesn't have any friends out there. This is not where her school is at 20th and California. Her residence is at 60th and Honoree, and that's when we're continuing just to work with her family and friends to try to figure out where she is. But at that time, the detectives, they have no reason to believe that she's out in this area. We were using all available technology to see if they can locate Marlon in her car, but we were unable to do so. The uh, detectives also, uh, during this time frame, are also, they're physically going to all the hospitals to see if Marlon may have shown up there and possibly delivered a baby. Obviously, all those uh, efforts were met with negative results. As the superintendent mentioned, it was on the 7th of May where this case uh, took a turn. Working with one of Marlon's friends, one of Marlon's friends uh, stated to the detectives that Marlon was on a chat site on, a, on Facebook. Uh, she gave the detectives the proper information and the detectives at that point were able to get into and see that, that chat site. At that chat site, they found out that Marlon was in contact with uh, Clarissa Figueroa, who is our charged offender at this time, and she was involved in this Facebook group. 
So the detectives now learn on this day, Marlon uh, went missing and she arranged to go out there to pick up baby clothes or some baby items from this lady at 79th and Pulaski. We're able to uh, run the particulars on Ms. Figueroa and we get our address of 4100 West 77th Place and detectives go directly to that address and they knock on the door and they're met with uh, our offender's daughter, Desiree. The detectives really did a really nice job here because you got to understand, I know we have all the information now, but at this point the detectives are just knocking on a door. We, we don't know anything at this point. And they talk to Desiree for a while and they're able to kind of solicit from Desiree, well, where's your mom at? My mom's at the hospital. Well, how come uh, she had some uh, issues with her legs? And then they continue to talk to her and talk to her. And Desiree says, well, my mom also did just deliver a baby. So at this point, you know, the detectives obviously are uh, understanding what's going on here. They search the area, and the detectives actually find uh, Marlin's vehicle at 7721 South Keeler, which is not far away. So at this point, our detectives are kind of fully aware of what's going on, right? They know the missing went to the above location this very same day on the 23rd of April. They now interview the offender's daughter, who gives an extremely odd story about her mom delivering a baby, and the detectives locate Marlon's car in the area. So we kind of know where this is headed. The detectives are starting to work with their supervisors. We're trying to devise a plan to gather more evidence and start talking to these possible suspects, because it's still now we don't really know what we have. Uh, the detectives on the 7th of May, they do go to the hospital and they do a basic interview with our offender, Clarissa. She denies that Marlon came to the house on the 23rd of April, but she did admit to knowing Marlon and uh, meeting her in the past. So from the 8th of... Quick pause, quick pause. Um, if any of you are struggling with the sound, the sound is boosted and it's loud. It's just that it's mostly on one side. So they, you know, sometimes with press conferences, sometimes with court audios as well, they unfortunately, it's probably an error release the audio with only mono, I think it's called, the, just the one side, right? So just switch to the other AirPod if you can't hear it. I will also be linking this press conference uh, for you in the description box, so if you want to see it again, then you can. The 13th of May, over the next several days, detectives uh, subpoena the hospital records, and they're trying to retrieve all the DNA evidence from all the parties involved. So you have Clarissa, who's saying that she had this baby. We need to re we recover DNA from the baby and the actual father. Um, and at this point, we're fully aware which direction, like I said, this is going, but we're completing all the necessary steps. We're getting all of our evidence lined up in order to, to confront uh, Clarissa. We're working with our uh, Illinois State Police uh, Crime Lab members. We determined Clarissa is not the mother through DNA and that Giovanni is the actual father. Unfortunately, we still hadn't located uh, Marlon at this time, but at this point we have enough evidence. And on the 14th of May is when the detectives, along with crime lab personnel, execute the search warrant at 4100 West 77th Place. Uh, there's bleach and clean solutions were discovered at that time, and the four individuals who were at the house were brought into Area South for interviews. Later on that evening, while detectives are doing their search, they find a garbage can on the premise, which is it's kind of in a, a hidden area on the premise, and unfortunately that's when they discover the, uh, the remains of Marlin. Uh, the medical examiner obviously gets all that information, and on the 15th of May, the medical examiner states the cause of death is strangulation. And the device used to strangle Marlin is also recovered, along with other items in that garbage can. Um, the medical examiner stated the cause of death was strangulation, and the device used to strangle Marlin, and along with other items, are recovered in that garbage can. Our crime lab personnel stay on the scene of this residence, and they're, they're you know, sifting through everything in the house, and they're finding remnants of burnt clothes, they're finding some blood indication on the living room carpet, some blood indication on the hallway, some blood indication on the bathroom floor. And then the detectives who actually aren't here right now are the detectives who are still back at Erie South interviewing people. But last night at 1.30 in the morning, um, due to some pretty skillful uh, interrogation, Desiree Figueroa, who is the daughter of the mother Clarissa, she confesses that she assisted her mother strangling uh, Marlon. So at that point, uh, we were able to charge all these offenders. All right, we'll take questions if you all have any. Okay, now as usual with press conferences, the questions are a little quiet. I hope you can hear it. Um, should be able to. Let's have a listen. Hey, let's look at what the crime was. I, I, you know, only they know that. We can only assume raise the child as their own.
again, we didn't get the break in that case until the 7th of May. Okay, there's a lot of evidence to pour over. Once we got that information, you still don't just, uh, this is not TV, this is real life. So we still have to gather the evidence that we need to properly charge the individuals responsible. So a lot of the media questions here are about, wait, 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 how long did this take? So when did Marlene go missing? And then when did you figure out that the other two, it wasn't their baby? So that's what they're asking, which is why I think the answers come across a little defensive because like, wait, what? You know, <laughs> people expect the police to just solve it overnight, but they had nothing to go on at the time. It was a missing pregnant teenager. Then they found her car and they're like, hmm. Then they had to test that. Then they looked into a social media and so it went, right? You know, I, I tell you this, we, we have to be mindful that there's a family out there grieving and hoping for a miracle for this, this young baby. So those details we'll just kind of leave out for right now in respect to the family. So I won't comment on the hospital, you have to ask them their protocols and procedures, but what I can tell you is this, on that particular day there was nothing to tip us off that those two things were related, it just wasn't. Marissa didn't submit to one, right? Yeah. When the detect so the detectives went to interview Carissa on that seventh of May once everything was going on and we were able to get DNA from her on the eighth of May. So if the hospital prior to that had not determined that this baby was not admitted, she would have been admitted to the hospital and then there was Once again, I'm not gonna yeah, yeah comment on, on Christ Hospital's uh, their their protocols. I don't know the pro I don't know hospital protocols. I don't think they DNA so Mama Goonster says, I think three weeks to figure out they're not the parents is a bit ridiculous. Yes, but if the hospital didn't report it and they're just like, yay, new parents. There was no, no one called the police about them. They were just two people that arrived and she said, oh, she, she just delivered this baby at home. Clarissa, right? And Shane, the baby wasn't breathing and then they helped the baby. And eventually the police, you know, started based on their social media investigations, tracking down the person who Marlene was talking to last, who was Clarissa. And when they went to go and look for her, they said, no, she's at the hospital because she's just given birth. And that's when they were like, oh crap, like I think I know what's happening here. So for me, I think it's obvious, right? The fault lies with the hospital <laughs> in seeing this woman has no sign of just giving birth and there's blood on her upper half, on her arms, on her face, on her shirt, but not anywhere on the lower half. And they thought, that's strange, but they didn't report it to um, anyone for two weeks. That's scary, right? <laughs> so, yeah. DNA swab every single baby and, and mother, but I don't know that, so I can't comment on Christ Hospital's protocols. The detectives, obviously, uh, like I said, once they, once they got to this house and they interviewed Desiree and they interviewed Clarissa, they knew we got to get DNA off these people. We got to do our detective investigation to prove this case. I can't comment on hospital protocol. She the day Unfortunately, yes, the, the timeline is Clarissa goes over there on the 23rd of May and we have this evidence now, 23rd of April, I apologize, 23rd of April, and we have this evidence supported by you know technology with her car. We see her in her car driving in the area of 79th and Pulaski. And then it's four hours later that our defendant, Clarissa, calls 911, is standing out on the street with a newborn baby, stating that I just had a baby. So unfortunately, within this very short time frame, our missing was already, they already killed our missing. So we have Th 
So the, the device in the garbage can was, was some sort of coaxial cable, like a cable. That's what they used to, to strangle Marlon. Uh, the third individual who was arrested is Clarissa's boyfriend. I'll get you the actual, his name and information. He's charged with concealment of a homicide. He didn't actually do strangulation. Correct. He concealed the murder. Do you believe this is a one-time incident because, I'll be honest with you, there is some obviously confirmed So obviously we, we solicited the confession. We're, we're going to now at this, you know, we're going to obviously go through uh, Facebook and whatever else we can to see if it, obviously if they have attempted to lure anybody else over there in the past with that. You know, did they ever? And also earlier someone was saying, why would you say anyone else expecting in May? But based on her, what appears to be strange psychology about her son and losing her son when he was 20 years old and. I don't know if maybe his birthday was in May, if, because why would she plan it for May? You know what I mean? Because she planned it for months. That would be scary. She's just projecting all her grief and just pretending that she's just going through, you know, pregnancy with him again, the son she lost. The red stiletto said, don't forget, the police thought Marlene's husband had something to do with the disappearance. They always suspect the husband. Yeah, they did at first. So even though it was three weeks, the hospital hadn't tipped anyone off. And the police were busy doing the investigations and they were investigating the husband. Definitely. Shame. He said it was extremely, he felt defeated. It was traumatizing. I can't imagine. Sure. Police interrogations, lie detector tests, all of that. That said, it appears from our interviews that this was the first time uh, that they did this. And, and unfortunately, I understand everyone looking back and playing armchair quarterback. It's like all these red flags that happened on the 23rd of April. But these uh, defendants also, you know, were not that wise. I mean, the, the body's in a garbage can on the premises with, with the murder weapon inside, and, and we were still able to get it, you know, that, that, uh, that much later. So I, I, I don't know. We're going to look at that, obviously, but I, I don't believe that that's the case. <laughs> It's on the property, in the backyard, yeah, on the property. They were looking at her social media accounts, but remember, this is a 19-year-old woman. If you know 19-year-olds like I do, they have a ton of social media stuff. So unless somebody points you in the right direction from the onset, it takes time to go through all this stuff. Did they yeah? try to burn the body in the fire pit? Does not. All right, one more question. I'm just going to pause for a second. Remember that she actually, she was dreaming up, but that she was now suddenly pregnant again. And she actually was, that's how the story started, with her pretending to be pregnant. And it really escalated from there. So she actually shared an ultrasound picture. I wonder where she got that. But she, she had put, I mean, her name is on it and everything. So I don't know if it was an older one or when. It's on my presentation there. We should look at that more closely. <laughs> but maybe that's why eventually she's like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, who else is due in May? Because I am. Because she'd been posting about it for a bit in those groups on Facebook, right? Okay, the press conference is almost done. I believe in 2017, uh, Clarissa's 20-something uh, year old son passed away from natural causes. First, first, I want to mention that uh, we, we actually uh, we do have a, a young detective here who, who translated for everything. I understand the anger that the family's going through. We can't even imagine it. But we, we did have a translator assigned at all at all times, and we're going to continue to follow up with the family and answer whatever questions we can. So I understand their anger, and, and if the direction of their anger is at us, but I understand. But we did. We do. We don't just uh, not talk to people because I can't communicate the language. We had a translator, and she did an, she did do an excellent job. Yes. Okay. So listen, let me, uh, let me just follow up on that last question. So Almost there. Uh, Ashley says, there's probably websites they can get fake ultrasounds from. I, I believe so. It's like, oh my word, Letitia's talking to a fake polygraph test. Yeah, yeah, you can get fake ultrasounds as well. Oh man. Look, you know, 
all of us up here are parents, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters. So it doesn't escape us the emotional drain that, that something like this takes on people. You know, so that's understandable. And, and l listen, I can't even imagine, pretend to imagine what that family's going through right now. They should be celebrating the birth of a young baby. Instead, you know, they're mourning the loss of the mother and possibly that young child. You know, so there's going to be anger associated with that. When things of this nature occur, the first thing people do is look in retrospect, what could we have done to maybe prevent this? So we understand that. What I can tell you is this, I know our detectives do the best they can, and oftentimes in very trying situations. It's not always the way people want it to be done. You know, that's just, that's just the reality of the world we live in. You know, but I, but I think these detectives worked as hard as they could. You know, again, once they got that break on May 7th, then things started going quickly. There was nothing to point us in that direction in the beginning. You know, the social media uh, questions, yeah, you know, we were looking at that, but it takes time. You have to remember, this is real life. This isn't 48 hours. You know, it just isn't. It doesn't work like that. It takes time. Look at the manpower we have back here right now. It takes time to go through all those things. But at the same time, I understand that family's grief. I really do. Um, so we just strive to do better when we can. When we have people that don't speak the language, then we provide them with translators. Last question. Have, have, uh, you had said that uh, the plane was before. Are there any that Yes. So, so, before? Yes. So apparently, uh, Miss Ochoa had uh, bought other baby items uh, from Clarissa in the past. So they knew each other. Okay. Thank you all. So she'd been to the house before? Yes. Okay, so that's the end of the press conference. It happened May 16th of 2019. So I hope that filled in some of the investigative timeline as well for you. I've got another clip to show you quickly, which is actually, because I wanted to see, I wonder if Clarissa's other daughters or family said anything. Did they speak out? And they actually did in this little interview right here. I think this is one of her other daughters. So let's have a listen to this. They are monsters. It's just too much already. It's just too much. Scared to show their faces or reveal their names, the adult twin daughters of Clarissa Figueroa described the horror after learning that their mother and half-sister Desiree allegedly murdered a woman, took her baby, and tried to pass it off as her brother. Oh, my mom goes, do you want to see your baby brother? That was April 24th, the day after they say mom Clarissa called to say she had a baby. The twins say they hadn't seen their mom in nearly a year, but they did keep in contact with her over the phone. So you walked, you and, walked, you yeah. moved around the labor and delivery. Yeah, I was in the, problems. yeah, well, any problems. I just went in her room. The room she's referring to, labor and delivery at Advocate Christ. The sister says her mom stayed there for three days, accompanied by her boyfriend, Peter Bobek, who they confirm is seen in these pictures. One sister says she visited her mom two days later on April 26. I seen the baby and I touched the baby and I didn't think of anything about like it wasn't my brother because my mom said it was my brother. Both women say they grew up in an unstable home and were neglected by their mother. I was a, a teen mom at the age of 16. I lived on my own since then. Tonight, both sisters admit they had doubts. They should have checked my mom. They should have made sure that the baby was her mom. Like if they knew that her tooth were tied, why didn't you double check? Like why didn't you check if that was her baby? The twins say they will not be able to forgive their mother and sister and sent a message to the Ochoa family. I want to tell Marlene's family that I'm so sorry for everything that they're going through. Shame. Definitely an emotional interview. One of the twin sisters says that she will not attend the court proceedings and if her mother and half-sister are found guilty, she will not visit them in prison. Damn, okay. Sure. So lots of people impacted by this. Absolutely horrendous for Marlene's family. <laughs> what a shocking case, right? So thank you so much uh, for being here to study this case with me, learn as much as we can from it, and of course, talk about it. And hopefully Marlene's family and friends will be able to get justice for not only her loss, but also the loss of her baby.
Wow. So everyone, make sure that you take care of yourself. Some cases are very difficult. I know all cases, all true crime cases are difficult, but some might affect each individual differently than others, right? This one was really scary for me. It's very difficult to think of all of this because it's just, as someone said earlier, so barbaric and it just escalates. It is so scary. And to think that it's like, oh, okay, connecting on Facebook, like moms, you know, talking to each other and being like, hey, do you want to maybe trade a stroller? Do you got some baby clothes? Okay. Like, who would think that this would happen? Now we know it's possible. Oh, no. So scary, yeah. Oh, word. Uh, Hot Cocoa with Extra Marshmallow says, this is scary. I'm pregnant and this almost happened to me with my first pregnancy. Oh, my goodness. That sounds scary. I'm so sorry about that. Thank you so much, everyone. Please leave your comments below. If there's anything that I may have missed or, you know, that maybe we could continue talking about, whatever it is, please send me an email, grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com. Yeah, that's about as much as I could <laughs> handle with this case. So I hope the presentation was okay. If you liked it, please like and share this video. Uh, not because you like the topic. It's just to so that others can see it. It's software. It's uh, algorithm stuff, right? So just if you like it, more people will learn this information. And let's see what happens with the trial. I'm not too sure I'll cover it. I'm not even sure if Chicago has cameras in the courtroom, if they'll be live streaming it or whatever's going on. We shall see. And we'll also see what we are doing at the time because there's always lots of things going on, right? Uh, tomorrow, if you're watching this live with me, today is January 11th of 2024. Tomorrow's January 12th. And so that will be the sentencing of Teresa Black. We've just finished watching that trial. The verdict was reached after six days. She will be sentenced tomorrow. So hopefully we can see that. I'm not exactly sure of what time. So if you know the time, if you've got a source or something, please send it to me on my email. And tomorrow apparently is also the hearing uh, for, it's like a, a status hearing for Jesse Kurshevsky, who is yet to be sentenced. That could be the summer of 2024. So we will also see what time that will be and what's happening. I'm kind of just going to be keeping my eyes peeled. I'm not too sure. And I'll hopefully see you then. So make sure you're subscribed with your notifications on so that you don't miss out because I don't have like a set time for those things yet. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Yeah, Kathleen says you are giving a thumbs up to the presentation, not the topic. Exactly. Because some people feel a little uncomfortable being like, oh, I don't know if I should like this topic. It's not about the topic. It's just the work I've done to present this to you and just so that other people can learn more about this case. All right, everyone, stay safe. It's time for a cup of tea and bedtime. <laughs> well, for me, obviously, I'm in the Netherlands, so it's half past 10 at night. <laughs> okay, bye, everyone.